Thank you so much for making time this evening. We have a long evening planned, so I want to begin by letting you know what the plan is for today. We will have a lecture about the history and journey of Ghazal. The lecture will take about 75 minutes, give or take 15, depending on your interest. Then we'll have a little break, and after that we'll have a live performance of Ghazal by one of the finest Ghazal singers of our time, Tahira Sayyid. A few of you may know her, a few of you may have parents who know her, okay? So let me begin by sharing with you the agenda for today so that we make sure that that is what we are interested in. I want to begin by talking about Urdu poetry. Then I want to talk a little bit about Ghazal, its structure, its content, its history, its evolution. A little bit about classical Indian music, the singing of Ghazal, the styles of singing Ghazal, and major Ghazal singers of our time. Does this seem okay? And I'm going to speak in English because I'm assuming not everybody knows Urdu and Hindi. Is that a safe assumption? Okay. Um, sorry, just a mic turn. Can you know what I'm oh, can you? No, it's not going to work. I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, the mic is not on? Yeah. I thought I did. You have to turn it on. Your zone. Okay, so let's. Okay. Okay. Let me try the other one. Hello? Emerson? Okay, it's on now. Whatever I said so far wasn't important anyway. <laughs> so, okay. Now, one of the things that I always talk about is when we look at the culture of South Asia, specifically India and Pakistan. Two things are very important elements of the culture. One is music and the other is poetry. They have a long, varied, very rich and vibrant history. And one of the important things about Urdu poetry, which is the language of India and one of the languages of India and the national language of Pakistan is that Urdu poetry is a performative art. If you look at poetry of English language and that of many Western and Eastern countries, poetry is written mainly to be read. Whereas in India and Pakistan, Urdu poetry is written to be recited and sung. So the first thing that I want you to remember is that Urdu poetry is a performative art. It is not something to be read necessarily. It can be read, but it is usually recited or sung in sawaris known as mushairas, which are gatherings of poets and of people who love poetry. Now, there are more than a hundred forms of Urdu poetry. We have the Hazal, we have the Muhammad, we have the Masnavi, we have the Musaddas, we have the Mankabat, we have all of these different genres. But out of all of them, the single most important and popular one is Ghazal, and it has been Ghazal for over 14 centuries. Now, let's talk about Ghazal. Ghazal is a poem which deals with love, and with love comes loss, longing, and romance. And Ghazal is very similar to the structure of the Petrarchan sonnet in English poetry. But let me say a little bit more about this. There are poems that are classified based on their subject, and there are poems that are classified based on their structure. Ghazal is both specified on structure and on content. On content, it is about love, loss, longing, romance. And on structure, it has couplets of two lines each, two hemistics each, which have a common refrain in which rhyme. But we will get into more detail so you can understand some of the terms associated with the ghazal. But so far, I've said that Urdu poetry has more than a hundred forms. Ghazal is the most popular and it is defined both by content and by structure. So ghazal has its origin in 7th century Arabia, 1400 years ago, there was a form of an Arabic poet 
poem known as Kasida. And Kasida had three parts Naseeb, Rahil, and Kasida. Naseeb was the first part which dealt with romance, love, loss, and longing. Rahil was the second part which talked about loneliness and the isolation of human existence. And Kasida was the third part in which praises were sung of one's own tribe, the ruler of one's tribe, people of one's own race or people of one's own religion. So we had the Naseeb, the Rahil and Kasida as the three parts. And the Naseeb started evolving into a separate poem which came to be known as the Ghazal. The evolution started in the Umayyad period. There were four caliphates after the Prophet Muhammad. This was the second caliphate and continued until the Abbasid period. So it was over a few hundred years that the Naseeb got separated from Qasida and became Ghazal. Now Ghazal at that time used to have four main topics. The first one was Udhari. Udhari means courtly love, where you talk in terms of romance and praise your beloved. It's courtly, it is very romantic, it's very florid, it is very flowery in language. Then we had Hisi Ghazal, which is all about sexual longing for your beloved. Then there is Mudahakkar, which is about same-sex love, where you spoke about your beloved who happened to be of the same sex. And lastly, Tamhidi means an introductory passage to another poem, to another dance, another performance. So these were the four original topics of Ghazal. Courtly love, known as Udhari. Sexual lust, known as Hisi. Mudhakkar, which was homoerotic love. And Tamhidi, which was the introductory passage. By the 14th and 15th century, Ghazal had moved to Persia and primarily the works of Rumi in the 13th century and Hafiz in the 14th century made Ghazal popular in the region. It was in the 18th century that Ghazal moved to what is today India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. So a Ghazal can have any number of couplets. It can even be of one couplet, which is known as a Fard. And there are Ghazals which have several hundred couplets. So there is no restriction on the number of couplets that a Ghazal can have. A couplet is known as Sher. Now I have a question, am I going too fast, too slow, or it's just okay? Okay. And I'll be happy to share these slides with the recordings if anyone wants, so if you have an interest later. Okay. And some of the major poets I have listed here, the first major poet of Ghazal was Hazrat Amir in South Asia, was Hazrat Amir Khusro in the 13th century. And then we had Kuli Qutub Shah who made the first collection known as Diwan of Ghazal followed by Wali Dakani all the way to Jigar Muradabadi in the 20th century. Now Ghazal deals with love, but there are two distinctions of love in Ghazal. There is Ishke Hakiki and there is Ishke Majazi. Ishke Majazi is the love for another human being. Ishke Hakiki is the love for the Creator, the God, the Bhagwan, anyone that you worship. As Sufism became popular in the region, the distinction between Ishke Hakiki and Ishke Majazi became blurred. And there are a lot of couplets, some of the best ones, where I may feel that something is about Ishke Hakiki, you may feel it is about Ishke Majazi, you may feel it's about Ishke Hakiki. So the best poetry leaves that part ambiguous and lets the listener decide based on his intellect, his emotional makeup, his education, his age, his maturity, his personal setup, what he wants to take out of the love. Is it the love for another person or is it the love for the Creator? 
Now there are nine items that are very technical but I want to go through them because I've been studying Ghazal for more than 10 years and talking about it for seven and I've never been able to find a good definition on the web or in a book of what a Sher, Misra, Radif, Kafiya, Takhallus, Matla, Makta, Behar and Zameen is. So I've made the slides both in English and in Urdu in a way that I believe is very easy to understand. If it's not, please tell me how I can make it easy because I believe we should know these things. Okay? So the first thing is a Sher is a couplet. It has two lines which are known as hemistics and a ghazal has any number of couplets or ashar. I have put up a ghazal of Mirza Ghaleb, one of the greatest poets of the Urdu language here. Can anyone read Urdu? Okay, so let's, there's only two or three people, so I'll move to the English version. This is a ghazal by Ghaleb which says, Koi umid bar nahi aati, koi surat nazar nahi aati, mohat ka ik din moyan hai, neend kiun raat par nahi aati, aage aati thi haale dil pe hasi, ab kisi baat par nahi aati, जानता हूँ सवाबे तात और जोहर पर तबीयत इधर नहीं आती मरते हैं आरजू में मरने की मौत आती है पर नहीं आती काबा के समूह से जाओगे गालिब शर्म तुमको मगर नहीं आती सो ईच वन ऑफ द टू लाइंस आर अ कपलेट नोन एस द शेर नाउ इन अ कपलेट वन ऑफ द थिंग्स दैट यू शुड नोटिस इट दैट इट हैज टू लाइंस and there is a rhyme and there is a refrain. We have some seats up front too. Would you like to come here? Okay. Okay. Now, the first line of a share is known as Misrai Ula. The second line is known as Misrai Sani. A misra in English is hemistic, and if you look at this, Marte hai arzu mein marne ki is the first line and is known as misrai ula. Okay, and the second line of a share, Maut aati hai par nahi aati, is known as misra sani. So we have a share which has two lines, each line is known as. A misra, the first misra is known as misra ula. ula, and the second one misra sani. sani. Okay. So radif, at the end of each misra sani, you will notice that a word is being repeated. Nahi aati, nahi aati, nahi aati. The word that is being repeated is known as the radif in Urdu language and is known as refrain in English. Now there is another word which rhymes nazar, bhar, par, idhar, par, magar but is not the same. The rhyming word is known as kafia. So we have kafia which rhymes and radif which is the exact same. And then takhallus. Takhallus is the pen name of the poet and it usually mentioned in the last couplet of a ghazal, sometimes in two couplets as well. But it's the pen name and in this case it is Ghalib. Matla is the first couplet of a ghazal and both the lines, the Misrai Ula and Misrai Sani have the same radif and kafia. You will notice that the radif is nahi aati, nahi aati and bar and nazar are the kafia which are the rhyming words. Then makta is the last share in which we use the name of the takhallus. If we have two shares that have the same, that mention the takhallus, the name of the poet, that is known as husne makta. And if we have two matlas with the same rhyme and scheme, they are known as matlai sani or husne matla or zebe matla, depending on uh, whose book you are reading. <laughs> and finally, the most important thing is Behr. Behr is the meter or the length 
of a ghazal of a hemistic of a misra and behar is made up of dummy syllables called the arkan which come from arabic poetry and define the length the pauses the stresses in the length of a meter and there are eight arkan mafailan mustafalun fa'alatun fa'alatun and we combine them to form 19 different behars and this is more difficult than uh, when i teach a class at nyu we spend about 3 hours on the 19 behars but if you are interested i can share the material but basically we have some dummy syllables called the arkan eight of them and we arrange them in different ways to come up with meters of 19 different lengths and then finally we have what is known as zameen which is equal to meter plus kafia plus radif so it defines the basis the zameen the floor of a ghazal on which it is based and different poets have written ghazals in the same zameen and there is a famous ghazal of uh, ghalib phir mujhe deeda e tarjad aaya dil jigar tishna e faryad aaya and then fani badayuni a century later wrote a ghazal with the same kafia same radif same behar which was the behar e ramal phir wo andaaz e nazar yaad aaya dil jigar ta ba e faryad aaya so i have the point that i'm making here is that once the behar kafi and ratif established the zameen anyone can write a ghazal in it and poets have often done that and with that i end my section on ghazal any questions so far and i know i'm throwing a lot of material very quickly but you'd be surprised how much you are going to remember i'm always told that people end up remembering much more than they think so any questions so either you understand everything or you understand nothing it's one or the other okay and i i have knocked out two things but i let uh, yeah sorry ji you know it one is uh, it's starting wants to start writing a ghazal yeah you know so can, can you give us some pointers as how to go about it okay in my opinion mm -hmm. if you want to write poetry you need to first study the poetry of the classics classical poets like the ghalib mir masafi dakani kuli kutub shah then you need to develop your individual independent thought because if you are not going to have new thought then there is no point in writing more poetry because it has already been done that and then you should write it without worrying about meter or zameen or kafia too much once you have put it on paper have somebody do what is called isla and they will fix it because when people try to write ghazal they get stuck with the syntax and the language and the meter and all of those things and they forget that the thought is more important than the structure and i always say work on the thought and have somebody correct the structure at a later stage how do you go about finding somebody to do this or oh, there are tons of people in Dallas we have people in New Jersey we have people in Pakistan and you will find them very devoted who would spend more time with you for no gain at all just to propagate the message the thing with the art says that people who genuinely want to promote the arts do it out of the love for the arts they don't look for anything um I mean it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn but I'll mention to you I've done more than 300 seminars on ghazal on kathak on sufism on qawwali I have never ever accepted payment for any all of these are done gratis I take time off from work my own I go on there and there are many many devoted people who will take time out of their lives and work with you on these things does that if you want I can skip this but this section talks about rag and tal how do you recognize a rag how do you count beats is that something of interest okay so the first thing is what is hindustani sangeet hindustani sangeet is the music of the region 
around the Indus River or more specifically northern India and Pakistan. As opposed to Hindustani Sangeet, we also have Karnatak Sangeet, which is the music of southern India. So we are going to talk about Hindustani Sangeet and Hindustani Sangeet has two basic elements, Sur and Rag, which is the melody and Le and Tal, which is the rhythm. So let's talk about both. Sur is a note of music, Sa, Re, Ga, Ma, Pa, Dha, Ni, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La. As we go from Sa to Re, the frequency goes higher, Re to Ga is higher, and as you can see, as we move from Sa to Ni, the frequency becomes higher. Now, do we have any engineering students here? What is the doubling of frequency? An octave. And this whole seven notes are known as an octave because from one sa to the next, the frequency has doubled. And now we have sa, re, gamma, padhani, which are seven notes. But when you get deeper into music, you find out that there are in fact 12 notes. Because sa and pa have only one form, but the re, ga, ma, dha, ni have two forms flat and sharp and so 5 times 2 is 10 and then sa and pa we have 12 notes and that is why we have black and white keys. So let's go from left to right. Left sa because it only has one natural frequency. Re has two, the lower and the higher. Ga has two, ma has the lower and higher. Pa there's only one, dha has two and ni has two. Now one thing that is very remarkable here is that Sare Gama Padhani are not unique to India and Pakistan. 99% of the music all over the world from Africa to Indonesia to Egypt to Turkey has the same 12 notes. And it's remarkable that these were developed at a time when people didn't use to travel. You didn't have cars, you certainly did not have ships, you didn't have airplanes. And you normally stayed within a four to five mile radius of where you were born. So the question is, why and how did the same 12 notes come into being all over the world? From Australia to America to Africa to Asia. Does anyone know the answer? The answer is very simple. And there's been a lot of research on this, and some people do not agree with the thesis that I subscribe to. There were two reasons these 12 notes were selected. Humans tried to copy sounds of nature, which A, sounded good, and two, could be reproduced by the human throat. And that is why the same 12 notes came into being, because the human throat was similar, and so was nature. And over centuries and centuries, and if we look at the Nate Shastar, which is 32 centuries old, we've had the same 12 notes for at least 32 centuries. Now, what is a rag? A rag is a melodic mode in which certain notes are used in a certain order and sequence, subject to certain rules. Now, one of the things about India and Pakistan is that music has been kept very hidden, very esoteric. People tend to not share a lot of knowledge about it, especially the practitioners. And what I've always felt, it's very simple to explain what a rag is. It's just a combination of notes subject to certain rules and some stipulations. So let's study what those rules and stipulations are. The first thing I want to talk about is Ras. Ras is emotional content. There is a book that was written by Hindu sage Bharat Mani 3200 years ago. And that book is the foundational treatise of all dance, drama, music of India and Pakistan. It has 36 volumes. And it describes in volume 6 
the nine principal emotions a singer, a dancer, an actor must master before he or she is allowed to perform on stage. And those are in Hindi, English and Urdu, Adbhut, Wonder, Bhayanak, Fear, Vibhashd, Disgust, Hashe, Laughter, Karun which is pathos, then anger, peace and beauty and heroism. And each rag of Hindustani Sangeet has one of these ras. So the first thing to know about each rag is that each rag has a specific emotional content and that is one of these nine emotions. Okay? Then the day is divided into eight prahars of three hours each. In Hindi, one three hour period is known as prahar. In Urdu, it is known as pehar. And there are eight pehars in the day and each rag can only be sung in one of these pairs. So it has to have a specific emotion and it belongs to a specific three hour period. Then the rest of the things, Arohi of a rag is how you note, use the notes in ascent. There is a famous rag, Malkos, Sa Ga Ma Dha Ni Sa, as you go, Sa Ga Ma Dha Ni Sa. Descent is Avrohi, Sa Ni Dha Pa Ma Ga Re Sa. Pakar are the catchphrases of a rag. Jati is a class. There are three jatis, rags of five notes, six notes or seven notes. Then we have a time, a ras, a vadi which is a note which is used the most, a samvadi which is used the second most, anuvadi which is uh, uh, not, uh, which is a regular note, a vivadi which is not used and a grace note which is touched lightly. And this essentially defines a rag. Nothing more, nothing less. So why do I talk about rag? When a ghazal is sung, it is always performed right when it is set to a rag. Anything that is not set to a specific rag is what we call avara or wavered singing. And we don't believe that's the right thing to do. Now let's talk about tempo. In ancient times we did not have clocks, we did not have watches, we certainly did not have metronomes. So there was only one thing that beat regularly at a fixed speed and that was the human heartbeat. And that was 80 beats per minute. At the time now over century it has come down. Nowadays the average is 72 I believe. Okay. And we, uh, that was used to determine tempo. Then we have, like we have Sare Gama Padha Nisa, in Tabla we have Na, Ta, Dhin, Ti, Tu, Kiratak, these sort of words. And since the Tabla is here and the owner is not here, I'm going to steal it and just, <laughs> actually, let me see if I can get on and show you how these symbols work. So we have na, dhin, tere, kete, tu, na, ta, ta. And we combine these to make a ta. Na, dhin, na, na, dhin, dhin, na, na, dhin, dhin, na, na, dhin, dhin, na. Or a lighter one, keherva. So I'm not a tabla player, but the gentleman who will be here later on is one of the finest young tabla players from Pakistan. We'll have him do a little solo for you. Okay? So that was just me showing a few syllables. Now a time, a time cycle, a rhythmic time cycle is known as a tal, and it has five things. Sum is the first beat. Tali is the beat on which you have stress. Khali is the beat on which you have a negation of stress. Avardi is the whole cycle. And then we have uh, Vibhags, which are parts in an uh, Avardi. Now what I've done is I've made a chart to make this easier. 
we take a cycle of 16 beats known as teen tal na din din na na din din na na tin tin na na din din na so the first beat is the sum right then we have tali at 1 5 and 13 and you may have noticed that if you go to a good concert of indian music and you have a smart audience, they will clap at a certain way. Na din din na, na din din na, na din din na, na din din na. So a uh, tali is always done like this, whereas khali is shown like this. Tali like this, khali like this. And khali in teen tal is on the ninth beat. And then we have four vibhags of four beats each. Na din din na, na din din na, na din din na. And then Avardi is the whole cycle. And if we put this on one cheat sheet, that's all you need to know about Tal. Vibhag, Avardi, Sam, Tali. Now people feel that it's very difficult to count beats. And I believe that it's not. So if you will indulge me, let's do a little exercise on counting beats. We will count from 1 to 16. But on 1, 5, and 13 we will clap and on 9 we will wave to show khali fair and the way you count the beat is you take a point the sum in the song and you count the beats until the next sum it's much easier than it sounds so let's play a song this is a song in rag uh, god malhar uh, gor kalyan by noor jahan where the sum is on a ah. So from one A ah to the other, we have seven beats, if you notice. The A's ah are in orange. We have 16 beats, right? So from one to uh, one A ah to the next, we have seven be uh, 16 beats. So let's see if we can count them. Have I lost everyone yet or just a few people? <laughs> No, but this is, no, give me a chance, this is not difficult, just see, I will count with you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, na, then, then, na, 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 na, then, then. Na then then na na then then na na then na na then then one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen one two three so all composition is also done in this for example na then Da tete da tete da da tete da gete na ge na da tete da tete da da tete da gete na ge na aja so everything has to be done in the sixteen beat framework. So the popular Taals in Ghazal, there are three. There is Dadra, which is Dha Tinna Ta Dhinna, Rupak, which is in seven beats, and then Kehrva, which is in eight beats. And a composition in Hindustani Sangeet is known as a Bandish. And a Bandish has the first part known as Asthai, and the second part known as Antara. And that's from classical Hindustani music. It translates very well into ghazal, where the matla is used as asthai, the first share, and all subsequent shares are used as the antara. And that is one of the reasons ghazal has become so popular in music. Now, one of the things that's very nice about ghazal, and we also have it in Thumri, is it is a strophic musical form. Does anyone know what strophic means? Any musical form in which all couplets or all stanzas are sung in the same music is known as strophic. And the interludes between the stanzas are filled in ghazal with something known as laggi 
in Hindi and Urdu, which is also known as Thaduni in Punjabi. And that adds variety, energy, and vigor to Ghazal and Thumri. And I'm going to play a very good laggi in a Ghazal sung by the very well known Indian singer Aarti Anklekar. Does anyone know her? She sang the songs for Sardari Begum. She's a well known classical vocalist. And Tari Khan on Tabla with her, I want you to see how well the laggi adds energy to the Ghazal. Now this is the laggy beginning. That was about Hindustani Sangeet. So we have rag, which is a combination of musical notes subject to certain rules. And we have tal, which is a rhythmic cycle. And a ghazal, when rendered properly, is performed, keeping in mind the requirements of rag and tal. OK? So let's talk about the singing of ghazal, why it became popular, how it became popular. And although we can see instances of singing a ghazal as far as the 12th century, it became a proper musical genre in the 18th century. Hazrat Amir Khusro, who was a musician, a musicologist, a poet, a linguist, a politician, a soldier, during the reign of Alauddin Khilji, the second ruler of the Khilji dynasty, was the first one to have composed ghazals in music, and he trained two ladies, Meher Afroz and Nusrat Khan in the singing of Ghazal, who are said to be the very first Ghazal singers in this world, and they sang in the court of Alauddin Khilji in the 13th century. Now, it wasn't until the early 19th, late 18th century that Ghazal became a major genre of classical music, of light classical music, and there were four reasons for its popularity. Parsi theater, Nawaj Wajid Ali Shah's work, the Tawaifs, and the record manufacturing companies. So first of all, in the late 18th, early 19th, and 20th century, there were about 20 or 25 major theater companies that were founded by Parsis in undivided India. These used to mount plays in Urdu, Gujarati, English, and Hindavi, which was the lingua franca of the region. And music was an important part of these theater music. They would have an orchestra in the pit. And even at the end of the play, the entire cast and crew would come and sing a song, very often a ghazal, as a farewell song to the listeners. So they made ghazal popular as a genre of music. Then Nawab Wajid Ali Shah, who was the ruler for nine years, the 10th Nawab of Awadh, and he was there from 1847 to 1856. He was very fond of poetry, dance, and music. He composed ghazals, he had compilations of ghazals, and he had two musicians, Kadir Pia and Sanat Pia, in his court who composed ghazals as genres of song music for him. So that was another reason for the popularity of Ghazal. Then we had what I call Dukhtarane Baam. Does anyone know what that means? Dukhtarane Baam? Dukhtar means daughter. Dukhtaran means daughters, the plural. And Baam is the first floor or the penthouse. So these are ladies of the night or courtesans as they say. But one of the important things that I like to mention is that people think a courtesan is a courtesan, but in older times, there was a whole science, a theory, a classification. We had the Besva, Devdasi, Domini, Kanchani, all of these. 
Do you know the differences? Does anyone know the differences between them? Is anyone interested in the differences? Okay. Now, a besva is a generic term used for a woman that entertains men to make a living. A devdasi is a Hindu courtesan who is usually given to a temple or to a deity or to the priest and she spends the life in the temple servicing the deity or the priest. We have a domini, these are women who sing both for men and women and who don't have their own salons. So they go from home to home to sing. We have Kanchani. Kanchani is a singing girl who is allowed into the Saralio, which is the women's quarters, and into the royal court, and even the Mina Bazaar, which was the Mughal fair or shopping fair for women. We have Kanjari, which is the lowest class of courtesan that has a, has a tradition and a heritage of being a courtesan as opposed to a randi at the bottom who does not belong to a form a family of courtesans we have low kasbis who are well read and well educated courtesans who belong to a family of courtesans we have lolanis that are courtesans that come from iran and only perform in persian we have the nochi which is a young courtesan in training a putariya who is a sex worker and then we have the tawaif which is the highest form of the courtesan who knows cooking who knows embroidery who knows poetry who knows dance who knows singing and usually knows five to six languages and there are two types of tawaifs the tawaif and the yeah what does the miras mean mirasani is somebody who uh, miras is heritage and anyone who has a heritage, a musical heritage, any heritage any is a mirasi or a mirasnan, but it's a term that has been used, especially in Punjab, as a derogatory term. So I make sure that I don't so put it up here. This is a term that I have learned growing up for women in Hyderabad in India who would come and sing and people. The collect from a term would be domni, because they had a heritage of this art. But it's a derogatory term, so I don't like to use it. Okay? Now, tawaifs are well-read, well-educated, classy, cultured women who serve the sheikhs, which are the tradesmen, the gujars, which are the herdsmen, the jats, which are the landowners, and the qazis, which are the bureaucrats. But Gharanedar tawaifs are the ones who serve the royalty, the elite, and the British Raj. And they used to have it very good until the Swiss Canal opened in 1867 when the time to travel from England to India became much shorter and Christian missionaries started coming to the region. The Christian missionaries did not like Indian culture and had a specific venomous hatred for the Tawaifs. They barred them from functions of the Raj they barred officers of the Raj and the British to visit their salons and they made life very difficult for the Tawaifs who had hitherto been very respectable. So what these women had to do was they had to still make a living, they still had to practice their art and in order to do that they gave up singing and dancing which was considered lower class and took up singing and writing ghazal. And some of them, like Mahalaka Begum and Malika Jan, went on to compose whole divans, collections of ghazals, which are of rather good merit. And since they started performing out of their salons and went to homes, they popularized ghazals. You had a question? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The Gharane Dar Tawaif was given much more respect in Lucknow than elsewhere, which is why they are unassociated. And some of the biggest works of literature that deals with Tawaif, like Hadi Ruswaz, Umrao Jan, in some of the films like Jan Isar, Umrao Jan, and others, 
uh, Ajatra are set in Lucknow. So people associate the Vais with Lucknow. But we had them all the way from Calcutta to Delhi to Mumbai. Yeah. Was it mostly an 18th century phenomenon or you have a prior history? Okay, no. Uh, first of all, it's the world's oldest profession. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, in one sect of Islam, we have a marriage known as muta, which is a temporary marriage. And that temporary marriage made it easy for women to become courtesans because it gave them some respectability, some legal standing. And that is why it became more popular with the arrival of Islam in what is today India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Does that answer your question? Okay. So that's on the Tawaif. Then at the end of the 19th century, the gramophone and the phonograph were formed. And the difference between the two, which is often confused by people, is a phonograph has a cylindrical rotating cylinder, whereas a gramophone has a flat disc. And people started making recordings, private recordings, on the phonograph, the cylinders. And you may know a brand known as Bose for headphones. The original forefather of the Bose family, Harminder Bose, was the first gentleman who started recording Hindustani Sangeet on these cylinders and selling them from his storefront. When the records came, they became very popular very quickly and more than 50 recording companies were established in India in a period of less than two years. And at that time, the records were two to three minutes long. And that was an ideal length for a ghazal, but not for a tumri or a khayal or a kawali. So ghazals were recorded very often. And the first recordings of Hindustani Sangeet were done in, in England. And they are known as the London recordings. And they were done in a two-year period just before the turn of the century. And I happen to have a catalog of that and that catalog shows that there were 20 Persian, 15 Hindi, 5 Urdu, 5 Gurmukhi, 7 Arabic ghazals that included Hafiz, Faraibi, and Asadullah Khan Ghalib's work. And then they came to India in 1902, and William Gatherbergs did the recordings on November 2, 1902. The very first recording was made of Gohorjan, and later on that afternoon, of two girls known as Rukmini and Sushila Bai. But since Gohorjan's record was rec released first, she is known as the singer who was the first one to ever record a ghazal. And I'll just let you listen to just a bit of the ghazal. It's a bad recording, but it's a valuable one. So it's nice. <laughs> Do you see the conical thing next to her face? That's the microphone of the time. You put your face in it and you sang into it. And we have some major early hits. If anyone is interested, I have these recordings as MP3 files, and I'd be happy to share them with anyone who is interested. Excuse me. OK. So we talked about Ghazal Gaiki. It evolved and became popular as a result of the Parsi theater, the courts of Awadh, the Tawaifs, and finally, the record companies. Now let's talk about styles of singing ghazal. There are about 10 to 12 well-established, proper styles of singing ghazal. And these are the Parsi theater, the rag-based, thumri, geet, mujra, kawali, mushaira, film, radio, and PTV style. But to understand these styles, 
let's go through a few things. Who knows the word abhine? It is a Hindi word. What does it mean? It means emotion or the art of histrionics, acting. And abhine has four categories. The angik abhine, when you use the body to act, perform, sing and dance. We have the vachik, which is the word from the throat, which is speech and singing when used to entertain, dance, sing and perform. There is the aharya, which is the decoration, the makeup, the clothes that you wear, the setting, the decoration of the dais, the stage, and then the sattvic abhinaya, which is the spiritual content of your music, of your dance, of your poetry, of your art. And angik are also further divided into the body, hastak, the movements of the hand, and mukhaj, the movement and the expressions of the face. And before I go any further, I want you to see how the angik abhinaya, the vachik abhinaya, the aharya, the sattvic abhinaya are incorporated into a single song. up for the performance you don't sing in a simple manner you celebrate the poetry the thought so let's talk about these styles in the Parsi theater style remember there were four types of Abhinay Angek, Vachik, Aharye and Satvik we have three Angek, Vachik, Aharye they don't focus on the spiritual aspect much the poetry is Ishke Mejazi, which is the love of human beings, as opposed to Ishke Hakiki. They are both Western and Eastern mus instruments are used. The orchestras are elaborate and large, and the poetry is very florid, very romantic. And I'll play just one couplet in this style, which is... You see, violins and harmonium together. Is this going okay? Meri maan jai hai. By the way, the lady who is singing this is the performer tonight. Maan and Qurban are the Kafia, Jaye is the Radif. Then we have the Tumri style in which we have all four Abhinay. Ishq is Majazi of another human being. We only use Sarangi, Tabla, Dholak, Sitar, Basri. We use old classical poetry and we use a lot of improvisation. So here is one short example of Tumri style ghazal. I'm sorry I'm rushing through it but I want to finish in about 15 minutes. Is that okay? You can handle 15 more minutes?
That's a ghazal by Amjad Islam Amjad. Then, that's what Iqbal Bano. Then we have the rag based ghazal in which we only focus on the singing. No ange kabhi nai, no ahariya, no nothing, just vachik. Suddenly nobody wanted to see Mehdi Hassan. <laughs> so it's just vachik. And here is an example of that ghazal. In rag Eman Tal Dadra. So you, this is a very famous uh, rag invented and incorporated in Hindustani music by Mir Khusro. Uses all the sharp notes, all seven of them. Subhanallah. the Geet style which is a classical style where we have Angek Vachik and Ahabhari we use both Eastern and Western music and the lyrics are usually simple and hummable because if they are hummable they make the Geet popular and here is an example a ghazal being sung by Khurshid Begum written by Amir Khusro in eight beats. So that's the laggy here. And there's the popular style where we have an example by Ataullah Khan Yazi. I personally am not fond of this style but it is so popular that you and so many intelligent well-read cultured people enjoy it that it would be unfair to have a presentation on ghazal and not mention it. Then we have the Mujra style 
in which the first half, the Misra Ula of the Ghazal is sung without rhythm. In the second half, we have rhythm. And an example of a Ghazal by Iftakhar Arif, sung by Roshan Allah Begum, in Rag Madhmad Sarang. And we have the Kavali style, then the Mushaira style, films had ghazals, we had radio, Pakistan spent a lot of time, money, energy on ghazal and as did the television station. This is a ghazal by Maulana Muhammad Ali Johar, by, sung by Farida Khanam. A relatively rare ghazal, you probably haven't heard this before. Then there's the TV style. And I have a section and I'm going to skip this one. It just listed some of the major ghazal singers. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that section. And in my ghazal, that ghazal, as I said, is the most popular form of Urdu poetry. It is a performative art. The history is at least 1400 years old. And it has continued to evolve. And it is best enjoyed when it is rendered with skill, knowledge, understanding and feeling. That's my information. If anybody needs these slides or any more information, we had to condense this talk into a 75 minute talk. Generally, this is a three hour lecture that I've developed for NYU and I've delivered there. And we have also done an eight hour version in Hong Kong of the same thing. So when you have nothing better to do, we can do an eight hour version. So thank you very much for being here. I think the organizers here have arranged for some snacks and food. But before I take the break, there's something I want to mention. I've been doing this for most of my life. Like I said, I've done several hundred talks all over the world, mostly in um, uh, concert halls and for organizations that do such things, and very rarely for student bodies. I am surprised and very impressed by the way these young men of PSA have mounted this event. It is not an easy thing to do, to bring a singer of Tahra Sayyid's caliber all the way from Pakistan, to get the right tabla player, to get the right keyboard artist, to put this together, to book all the travel, make sure visas are okay, book hotels, manage the sound, the slides, and then deal with somebody as persnickety as me. So ladies and gentlemen, a very big, Round of applause for the students who organized this. And after the food, we'll have Tahira Ji here. She is going to be accompanied by Harun Samuel, who is one of the finest tabla players from Pakistan, currently settled in New York. We have Hanif, who is going to accompany her on the keyboards. And for those of you who have not seen her or heard her, it's a sheer pleasure listening to her perform. Thank you so much for your time.